if you've had a chance to skim the book, there's actually um, about a, a five-paragraph section on mobile IP. And I suggest you read that because it's very interesting to see. You know, there, here you have this paper, which is a lot of pages, right? And here's what these guys thought it, it really distilled out to. And they also have some, some uh, they also bash it. <laughs> so you might be interested in seeing why they bashed it. Um, one other thing I just wanted to check. Did you guys, how well did you guys get this whole thing about the flow control? The, for congestion. I, I felt like I went through it maybe a little bit too fast. And I, I, I'm willing to go through another example so that you guys understand what, you know, this window, like why you pick a certain window size. Do you guys want, do you guys want that? Okay. Um, there are actually, if you go to the internet, there are, um, there are resources that you can, you can find that tell you how to tune these parameters. Like they say, you know, if you're, uh, they, they say that if you have a Windows 98 or 95 machine, uh, the default parameters that are set for the for these windows uh, tend to be uh, oriented towards modem users. So ev so when you plug in something like a high like high speed access at home, you might not actually get the performance that you're expecting. Not because it isn't available on the internet on the on the link, but because these parameters are set the wrong way. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's no easy way to to click and and say you know. Now I'm, you know, switch me over. I don't know about Windows Me if they if they take that into account, but uh, definitely if you have a Windows machine, uh, 98 or 95, there's a guy um, named Joe Navas, N-A-V-A-S, and he has a great FAQ about optimizing your your internet connections. And I I love I get into that stuff, so um, it's fun stuff. Okay, so the problem here was uh, in flow control was you have, in the default case, the simple case. Sorry, Yes. Oh. Oh, it fell. Thank you. In the, uh, you remember, we had the sender, we had the receiver. If we have, if we send the datagram and then wait for an ACK, this is a lockstep protocol. And the amount of time it's going to take to send a, a number of datagrams is going to be equal to that number of datagrams times the average round trip time. And what we want to do is actually lower that number so that we can send more data uh, in, in less amount of time. So the way that's done is using uh, windowing, in which case you send a set of requests, in this case four, and the point is that you send the next one without waiting for the act that comes back. Okay. Now, at the end, let's assume that this act here, the last act that comes back, is going to be something that tells you, okay, you can send the next window it's from the receiver. So then what we have is the amount of time it takes is the amount of time it takes to send n minus one of these times that times just just from the sender side plus the last round trip okay so that's that's how you do windowing and the question is how do you do how do you decide how many of these datagrams to put into a particular window now i gave you this equation yesterday which was it was window size equals Round trip time times what? The bottleneck. Like how, how fast the bottleneck can process these. So I think the easiest way to do this is to just let's take a very concrete example and let's see how, let's see how things, what, what happens when you use this as the window size, what happens when you try to push the window size up, and what happens if you try to pull the window size down. So let's say you have... I'm going to simplify this. Let's say you have a network where the latency is, um, I'm just going to use seconds. Usually it's in milliseconds, but let's say it's seconds, three seconds one way, three seconds the other way. And you're, um, let's say that, that the bottleneck here is that your, your receiver can process these at um, one datagram per six seconds. So according to this equation, what should our window size be? One. Okay. So this is a lot like lockstep, 
right? So let's see, let's see what, what happens uh, in the lock step. Well, we're sending, and let's see what happens when we try to push it above that. So let's say we send, the sender sends one. It takes three seconds to get there. Okay, so we're now at time equals three. We have something here. Now we, say, we, we immediately can start send, we can immediately send an act back at that point. So at time, so at time t equals six, right? What's going on? Well, this guy is halfway through processing that packet, right? This guy's already, or that, that, that um, datagram, which is the message. The, uh, over here, this guy's got, an, got the act back now that says, go ahead and send me another one. And so you start sending another one. Now, what happens three seconds later? Well, this guy's done, and he gets the next one. Okay, so notice how this guy, this guy's always going to be getting a packet right when he's finished with the last one. Okay, what happens if we start, if we send, let's say we send two instead of one? Well, we send two. Now, when, by the time we start sending the next two, this guy's going to be done with, by the time he receives the next two, he's going to be done with the first one, and he's going to have, he's going to have one, one that's buffered that he's going to start working on, right? But all of a sudden, like, these other two show up. So now he's got to, so now he's got to have a buffer that's, of, that's at least of size two, so because he's going to be working on the one that he, that he had buffered that he, was, that he had just uh, uh, gotten to. Now, what's going to happen to that? What, hap what size buffer do you need in this case in order to handle that window size of two? Is it bounded? Keeps increasing, right? Because now the work is going to keep increasing, right? So eventually, you're going to have congestion, which in this case, eventually, once they run, you know, run out of memory or the, you know, the, something's going to break and you're going to have to drop it on the floor. Your buffer size, your buffer is going to overflow. Okay. So this is so one one works, two doesn't. If you think about this, even 1.1 1 .1 will start will will cause you to, to will require a buffer size that's that's not fixed. Um, what about less than this? If you use less than, if you send less than, I mean, it, you, then it, it, and it, then you're under optimizing, right? So if this is the highest rate you can go, then pick that one. Um, but let's just to make just to make it even more clear. Let's say let's see what happens when you switch this to this to processing one datagram every three seconds. Okay. So what, hap what, what should the, what's our window size now? Two. two. Okay, so what happens here? You get two messages, this thing gets two. So it's got one buffered, and it's processing one. And this is at t equals three, right? Now, it's gonna send the ax back as it's doing that, right? So at t equals six, this guy's going to put two more on the line, and and what's going to happen? This one is going to be this one is going to be done already, right? Because it's three sec it's equals six. It's going to it, it says one datagram every three seconds. So it's going to start working on the buffer one. So it's pro it's, it's processing one, two on the way. Now what happens at, at t equals nine? It's done processing that one, and it gets the next two. Excellent. So notice that we're using the network here as, as, a, as a weird way to store messages. Right? It's almost like as, as the message is going, it's being stored on, by the network. And, and that's the buffer. That's, in essence, acting as a buffer, for, as an extra buffer for this receiver. Right? Because the message is here. It's processing, and then when it's ready, it's just a buffer that happens to have some time constraints because things are gonna things are gonna arrive uh, when they do, and you don't get a choice whether or not whether to slow them down. Now, if we try to increase the window size, what's going to happen? Well, let's say we do we do three, right? It's the same as before, right? You're going to have to start buffering these things, and then soon you're buff you're, you know you need more and more buffer space as you get more and more packets coming through. Um, now let's let's take one last one, which is let's say you can do three datagrams per second. Okay, what's how many are we going to be sending now? Eighteen. Eighteen. 
18 at once. Boom. You send 18 over. So what's going to happen there? You send 18 over. So now this guy's going to have time t equals 3 is going to have 18. And that means they're going to, he's going to start processing 3. And, he's, and 6 of them are going to be buffered. At time t equals 6, I'm sorry, I can't add today, subtract. Um, at time t equals 6, he's gonna, the, the, the sender is going to get an act back saying, I got all 18. And what's going to happen here? Well, these are going to be done. So we're going to have another three processing. I'm sorry. Thank you. I was like, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. <laughs> uh, this is too, too many. So, okay, let's see. This is three, three processing. Oh, okay, so this is three at three times three. Yeah. Right, so each second. So it's going to be done, it's going to have done another three, another three, another three, right? So it's going to be done with how many at this point? Nine. Nine. So it's going to have nine um, buffered. And it's going to start processing, you know, these. In the next three seconds, it's going to process another three, another. And guess what? By the time each, by the time that's done, and it gets the next 18, or it's all going to be these these nine are going to be done because we had three seconds and we do three per second. Yes. Quick question on the S side. Once it gets the act, what happens? Once he gets the act, he says, "Okay, the the receivers got acknowledged this." So this is this case. It gets the act. Now this act is, I'm assuming that it's an implicit permission to send more. So he's going to say, "Oh, I've got I've got the act bundled in with that as a, a, a message telling me I can send more. So I'm going to send the next window." So wouldn't that take time? It takes, yeah, it'll take a little bit of time. In this case, I'm assuming that that time is negligible compared to the seconds. Um, but it, but that could be. I mean, when you compute the round trip time. Usually, if you do it empirically, you know, you send a, a ping back and forth and you take some average, that's going to include the amount of time that, that this computer takes to actually process that at the, low, at the uh, network layer and send back a, an ACK. But yeah, empirically, that will take a little bit of time and you would have to compensate for that. Yes? So when you receive the NAC back, does it preload the window, like stick that extra, pull one out and put in the datagram that didn't get there? Yeah, if you get a knack back, then you say, okay, shoot, you know, I need to transmit another another couple of data, however many are, are datagrams didn't make it through, and you send those over. And as you can imagine, that disrupts the flow, right? Because now you're, you're you still have to wait for the permission to send, and the pipeline over here that was going is it gets disrupted too. The acknowledgement is just that it's been received, not that it's been processed. That's right. That's right. You send it 100, it'll say, yeah, I got 100. I yeah. Dropped. Well, it's, it, I mean, yeah, there could be errors in processing or, you know, there could be some issues, but that's at a higher layer in the network. At this layer down here where we're doing flow control, it's typically at the network or just the layer just above that. Uh, like in the case of TCP IP, it's just above the network layer. But in terms of the application layer, I mean, maybe those packets matter, maybe they don't at that time, so we don't know, I mean, we don't want to make any, introduce any overhead that everyone's going to have to pay for. Other, yes? In this model, it's implicitly assumed that the receiver has a buffer that will be at least one window size, or on the order of one window size. Is that a safe assumption to make generally? Generally, you can assume that when, that when a, a receiver asks for a certain window, that they have a reasonable buffer. Um, it's, it's gen generally, that's a, reason, that's a pretty good assumption. Um, the problem might happen is, uh, one problem that might happen is if, the receiver, you know, you're sitting there, imagine you're clicking on a bunch of different things, and, and all of a sudden all this data starts coming in. That could overflow the buffer. Another assumption here is that the processor can actually handle all that data. Um, if you're running on a 486 and this is a 100 megabit per second line, there's an 8 megahertz bus in there that might, might prevent you from actually even, you know, get that data um, and process it. Uh, but Th those are all things that when, when you actually uh, design these algorithms for the for real for practical use, you can't. I mean, in this case, we're assuming that this is three and it's always going to be three. That's a huge assumption that you can't make. You're probably going to have to do some kind of timing, uh, and and maybe say, okay, I'm measuring round trips and I'm going to take the average of the last ten round trips and use that as my assumption for what this is going to be the next time. Uh, Things like that are going to, you know, these practical implications have to come into play. 
but the main idea is still there. You have a window size, you have to wait for permission to send something back, and you want to pipeline it so that the bottleneck, which in this case is the receiver, isn't being overloaded, their buffer isn't being overloaded. Other questions about this? The bottleneck is not necessarily the receiver. It could be somewhere along the line. Absolutely. It could be something something in here that is a, is a slow link. Um, and it used to be, for example... Until after our first window fails. Yeah. Or you might, tr you, I mean, sometimes you might time this. There might be information that you have where you've timed this route before, and you might try that for the first window. Um, in fact, there's this, there's this uh, startup that I was talking to some of you folks about that a few, maybe it was like eight months ago, what they were doing was running around, they had all these different computers all around the internet, and they were actually timing, uh, do, sending these, these packets back and forth to try to figure out what the time, what the congestion was, available bandwidth would be, latency would be at different times of the day, different types of times of the week. And they wanted to use that data to try to, to, try to optimize uh, da uh, uh, flow through the internet on a statistical, using some statistical modeling. Um, and this for multimedia. So that's an, I mean, this is an important enough issue that there's, you know, there's actually, these are people from Bell Labs, like really about 11 of them, um, senior guys who, who actually think this is so important that they would, you know, be willing to, to do, to go out and take a big risk. Any other questions about, about this? So naming is a big thing in systems. Um, and what is naming? Well, naming is the, the idea is that you have a namespace, a set of p possible values. And naming is the idea of making associations between names and values. Uh, there's nothing that says you can't have two names referring to one value. Uh, but this is this is what it, this is very generically very high level what it is. Um, now let's get some terminology. Each one of these associations is called a binding, and the process of determining what value a name is bound to is called name resolution. Now this is very similar to what you've seen in Scheme. You know, there's environments and so on. And in fact, even here there are what are called contexts, which is that. A context is a, for, is a set of, of bindings uh, for a given namespace and a given set of values. So one context, for example, is domain names on the internet. Um, you could have that same name, you could use that same namespace in your scheme programs to come up with scheme variables to, that, that correspond to scheme objects. That's a different context. Uh, in Grapevine, you can have, you know, you can do the same thing. You can have domain names associated with some kinds of addresses. That's in a different context. So when you think about name resolution, either explicitly or implicitly, there should always be a context that you're referring to. Um, and in this case here, this is the if this is the primary name for something, and this is the secondary one. We we can call these all actually aliases for that name. And in Scheme, you can have aliases also, right? You can say define foo to be cons of something, define bar to be foo. Now bar and foo both point to the same. Uh, structure. So what's a name service? Well, a service is, it, uh, a name service is a service that helps you resolve names. And it may or may not be fully automated. So one of the, uh, there's a few examples. Um, one of them is uh, the domain name service on the internet. And we're going to go uh, through that uh, in, le in lecture for the second half of lecture. It's also part of the chapter that I'm asking you to read tonight um, for, from the book. Uh, but this is, an this is an important aspect of the Internet, so I'd like you to, uh, to understand how it works and what the issues are around it. Grapevine. You guys have all read about Grapevine. There's another. I mean, they have all this great stuff around uh, uh, naming and how to manage consistency, things like that. Uh, Ethernet cards, I'll talk a little bit about how Ethernet cards are named. Main thing here is that what do we want from a name service? Well, usually we want speed. Speed is huge. Um, the reason speed is huge is because it can be the case that, like, for example, on the, uh, when you're doing, uh, when you're on the Internet, anytime you have a domain name, you need to look up the IP address. So anytime you have to send a message, you need to know what that is. And that can, if that step takes a long time compared to sending the message or the processing you're doing on it, 
then it's then 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 you're wasting a lot of a lot of time. Availability. If you can't resolve names on the internet, you're hose, right? You're just you, you, you type in httpamazon.com and it just sits there and says, I don't know where to send this to. Um, so it's it's it, it's a block is a type of blocking operation. And scalability. Uh, you don't want to have a name service on the internet that only scales to thousands or hundreds of thousands. You want something that scales way, way beyond that and still gives you these other two objectives, which are speed and availability. What about accuracy? Accuracy. We're going to get into that. <laughs> we're going to get into that because it's, um, I, I, it, is, it is an honor for a reason. <laughs> so let's take one example, Ethernet cards. So how many of you all have ever picked up a, a, a raw Ethernet card and, and seen this, uh, a, this number like this? A, a, it's a hex, hexadecimal, um, and it's uh, six sets of, of these 8-bit. Of these uh, what, what, what is that called? Do you guys know what it's called? Um, what does the MAC stand for? Something like media address, something or other. Um, the, uh, but the point is that it's, it, it corresponds to an address that corresponds to the media. Okay, and that media is is either the card or is a uh, it, it can be a PCMCAA notebook card, uh, and what that is it's a unique 48-bit name that refers to that specific card. Now, notice this isn't like an IP address. How many bits is is your is your IP address? 32. So there's sort of four giga addresses. Um, how many are there here? Many, many more. Um, and one good reason why you want many, many, many more is that every Ethernet card has to have one of these. And, and when, you, um, when you think about it, how do you know when an Ether card is out of commission, Ethernet card is out of commission, or gets thrown away, or you know, who knows? Who, who's going who's gonna to keep track of all that? So in a sense, um, what's going on here is that these addresses, once you issue one, that's it. It's taken. You can never be sure that it's that it's ever that that it's ever going to be retired and reused. Um, now, why do we need these? Well, the uh, at the very imagine at the very lowest layer when you put an Ethernet card on the network. I mean, it doesn't have an IP address at that point. That's at a higher layer. So it, there has to be some way of differentiating that card from other cards. So some so that on the network you can you can send messages <coughs> to that host to the host that's connected that use, is using that card. So this is why you need it. This is the lowest layer uh, naming mechanism. And each, each network protocol at the, at the link layer uh, will have something that recognizes, have a mechanism to recognize what these numbers are for, the, for Ethernet um, in this case. So how do we assign these? Well, manufacturers get these from a, from a, one, a central naming authority. And this naming authority will say, here's, you know, here's your block, and you can go in 3Com, you can make a bunch of cards with this block, you know, Lucent, you can make cards with this block, and so on. And when a manufacturer runs out of addresses, they come back to the naming authority, and the naming authority gives them another block. Now, you can imagine that this system does have some inefficiencies. You don't want to give a block that's too big to a manufacturer. Uh, because once you give it to the manufacturer, I mean, what if they go out of business and they have, they don't, and, and you don't know which ones they actually used and which ones they didn't? I mean, it's almost, it's all, you're almost safer just once you give one of these out as a naming authority. Just that's, you know, you you block the whole thing out and never try to recover them because you have no guarantee that the manufacturer has good operating, good enough operating procedures that if they tell you we didn't use these, they actually didn't use them. Um, <coughs> And so the, you know, the, the big issue, of course, here is like, what happens when we run out of names? Well, <laughs> I don't know. There's, 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 uh, I mean, how many names do we have to go through here? What is 48 bits? Well, it's, <laughs> well, it's eight. So every, every two to the tenth is, is approximately, you know, it's one kilo. What, what's that? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's eight. So it's eight bits is is 256, and then two to the 40 will be, yeah, it's 256 million million because two to the 10 to the fourth, right, is a million million. Um, so it's 256 million million 256 tera tera uh, tera cards, right? Which seems like a lot. 
Um, Are these only used for cards? You said that something about PCMCI. PCMCIA cards, also like your notebook. Would they use the same naming scheme? Yeah. The, the scary part is what happens when you start when when you want to have Ethernet capability built into smaller and smaller components that are that are really cheap. Like you're, you've heard about, you know, nanobot, you know, nano type technology or very miniaturized technology. You've heard about technology that you can just throw away because it's so cheap, but you still want connected in some way. Then that's when you start when when this issue is probably going to start becoming more of an issue. Because what happens when everyone's buying you know a cheapo thing that you throw away the next day, and then you buy one of these you know the next week, and everyone's just going through them very quickly. Yeah, and this and there's yeah. So you'll have to do something. You'll have to alter the way that you that you manage this for that. How many hamburgers yeah. has McDonald's sold? About yeah, I think I think that's what, I, they stopped counting after a while. <laughs> yeah, it's this number. This number is very huge, so it's unlikely to. I mean, it's the the problem that we have is that technology. Remember, we said exponentially increase. You know, the technology curve exponentially increases, and so if the if the number of if the types of gadgets or or the size of things get smaller and we start using more and that number exponentially increases, then we have to start worrying about this. If we don't have the exponential increase, then we're Probably a bit. We probably have more time to to the spare. IP those are IP addresses. So those addresses are network layer addresses, yeah. and these are link layer addresses. So these are ones that the card, the, each Ethernet card, doesn't have an IP address associated with it because it could be used for different types of networks besides uh, the internet. Um, it could be used for Microsoft, Novell. Um, this, this is a lower level, lower level. If you ever came close to running out, especially if there was a specific class of technology that was causing it, couldn't you just update the protocol to say that one specific reserved name will have the meaning, look for a second name because we've run out of space? Yeah. And that way you could just keep extending it. You can do something like that. The the one issue with the, that proposal is it's it's you have to back you have to implement it um you know, it has to be backwards compatible. Yeah. Well, so, I mean unless it was in something like Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, what I'm well, probably will happen is once that, te that technology comes up, and if they do want to use these MAC addresses, there's probably going to be a lot of you know discussion about how to make sure that those types of devices don't don't cause this namespace to run out, um, and it might be a completely different namespace or like you said something that that's backwards compatible that 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 um, sits on top of the existing one, but I don't know what that you know who knows what that's going to be until it actually. Happens. You know, isn't I mean, Ethernet specifically, they don't all need to be unique. They all just need to be unique within their, their Ethernet network, right? So as long as it's big enough that there's a virtually zero probability that yeah. cards with the same name are going to be in the same. Yeah, I mean, you can get into these arguments to figure out what's the you know what's the probability. For example, you can say if I gave out a, a block of these, you know, ten years ago to someone. And these were the Ethernet cards that we were using coax cable, like the ones you read about. And these are, you know, one megabit per second or three megabit per second cards. You might you might argue that, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that those are, you know, that those are gone, long gone, and I'm just gonna start reissuing that block. Um, so you can do things like that. The thing that you have to be careful of is, you know, what happens if some of this technology makes its way around the world, you know, to to other places, and it's still being used there, and Imagine you take your, you know, nifty new computer and you go to, you know, some other place, and all of a sudden you're, you know, there's this name clash and you can't get on and your presentation goes bust. I mean that, <laughs> that you get into, you can get into arguments like that which are probabilistic, um, and I'm sure there'll be discussions around that when if that namespace seems to be running out. Would it be possible to like scan the name and get like the ID cards that are used and then see which of those addresses, that block of addresses? No yeah, you can. It's well. Let me answer the first question, part of the question first, which is that you can actually go and query the MAC address of a uh, of a car Ethernet card. That doesn't mean that it will give you the right MAC address because you can spoof MAC addresses. Um, but you can go out and query them. It's also the case that a bunch of these address, a bunch of these cards will sit behind corporate firewalls that won't let you suck that information out. Um, but uh, how many of you guys have media? Do you guys have Media One Roadrunner? Have you guys? So you know that the way they assign their their uh, their IP their uh, domain names 
is they they actually use the meet MAC address. So it's and what the, what uh, at least in Boston the me, uh, media uh, the Roadrunner, um, what it does is uh, they it's cable modem. It, they marry the cable modem to the MAC address that you're using, uh, and I don't know why they why they want to do that, but they do that. So if you switch cards, if you get if you upgrade from a you know, 10 to 100, then it's a big issue because you have to be calling some customer support to change that. Um, Yeah, but you can do that if you just pull that card out and put that same card into a router. That's what I did. <laughs> well, that, that's actually what you can. The current uh, generation of these uh, sharing uh, boxes, these routers slash you know in, in, uh, uh, internet sharing boxes, they actually allow you to spoof the MAC address. So um, a friend of mine has one, and you can click on there and say spoof the MAC address that this machine has over here, and then it just does it. So, as you can imagine, any, a lot of attempts to prevent, you know, the, the, the next good thing are usually thwarted very quickly. It's the domain name service that the Internet uses. And I'm going to get a little bit more in-depth into it. So, the namespace is a set of domain names, and you've seen them all, Amazon.com, Mumble.Mumble.Mumble. They're usually some name, name three uh, dot name two dot name one. If you look at the um, at this N1, the whatever is the, the last piece of it, that's usually called a top level domain. I think someone give me some examples of these. Com gov. Man, there's so many. You guys heard of the one T V? Now there's some new ones that are proposed that are supposed to be coming out. What are those? Professional. Yeah, biz, name, um, web. What's that? Oh, they are on their own. Oh. Oh, really? They're doing XXX? Idea Lab? Wow. <laughs> what have they been doing with their money? Um, wow, I didn't. I hadn't heard that. When did they announce that? Hmm. Year, and it's a bit controversial because they have these dot XX or dot uh. kids, and they say, oh, we make sure the content is for all the kids. How do yeah. Do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Looks like they're grasping. Okay. So, um, well, these names, what are they? What are they um, associated with? A number, which is uh, which otherwise known as IP address. IP address. <laughs> and what's the format of this IP address? Something done to the something. Okay, and what's that something? Eight bits. Eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. For a total of 32 bits. Okay, so the whole idea is if you have one of these IP addresses, you can send a pat you can send a message somewhere on the internet. If you have a name, that doesn't get you any, anywhere, uh, you know, anytime, you know, anytime soon until you have this this over here. Okay. Um, so what do we need? Well, we saw some of the objectives before. We need scalability. We need um, speed. Um, well, let's. How do we address some of these issues? Well, we're going to use our friend again, hierarchy, to reduce the complexity and to improve scalability. And we're going to use caching to improve our lookup speed and our availability. And, and just as, a, as an, a side note, DNS is typically implemented using UDP, uh, which we talked about uh, yesterday, rather than TCP. Does anyone, can anyone venture to, to guess why, that would, why you would want it as a UDP? Yeah, lower, overhead. lower overhead. TCP has all sorts of stuff that it guarantees, and DNS doesn't need it. So why hinder it with all, with all that baggage? So the way this is done is the is it, you, this uh, DNS introduces this notion of zones. 
Well, a zone contains a bunch of different things. It contains, it's a table, and it contain, it can be represented as a table, and it contains specific information for some hosts um, in a domain. So there are different types, there are different types of information, and uh, what's uh, called record of type A is usually what? It's an IP address. Um, there's, there's several of these, but I, I picked some of the more uh, common ones. MX is actually a mail ex uh, exchanger. So we already know what an IP address, what that value is. For mail exchanger, what this usually is, is a, is a pair, which is a host and a um, preference. So preference is some priority like one, two, three, four. And what this does is it tells you um, which, it helps you decide which host, mail host, to try to deliver to the mail to first. You have records of type NS, which is name server. And you also have records of type CNAME, which are aliases. Now, name server and aliases, these can either be of uh, the values can either be a domain name or, or a piece of it or an IP address and the same for the, for the, uh, for the alias. So what do these tables look like? Um, well, let's say we have um, the AD Uni. <clears throat> let's say we have a, an, a table for aduni.org. They'll have something like, uh, let's say, let's say that Shy had his own domain name on there. So they might have, it might say Shy, and this would be, say, a record of type um, uh, A, and it might give an IP address for Shy's machine. So. Uh, 192.168.0.23. It's one thing that might be in there. Um, there might be something that says um, the there's a uh, uh, that there's a, another domain in here called I don't know Greg. Where's Greg? There you go. Okay. So let's say that Gre there was let's say that Greg had his own little network on the side. And and uh, and he had his own domain name server running over there. You could have something that says Greg, and then that's a name and it's a name server. And I'll, I'll go through what these how these fit together. And let's just say we say we call that um, Greg DNS, and then we can have something that's called Greg DNS, and let's call that um, 192 168. 0.51. Okay, so how, what do these tables mean in the broader context? Well, in DNS, um, oh, well, I'm sorry, let me step back. One last thing that the zones have is some, in, some other information, which we'll see later on around caching and replication. The way this works is you inject a query into the into the DNS, you inject the DNS query into the system, and what that does is, in general, there's a set of root servers, which are the top. They serve top level domains like aduni.org. They do things like yahoo.com, and there's a few of these root servers, and these are the the you know the critical servers that that are spread around the internet, and Though if you have to resolve a name all the way from the beginning, you start off here at one of these, and what this thing will tell you is where are the domain names, uh, where are the DNS servers that handle each of these domains. So it'll say, well, here's one right here, which is sitting maybe in a box, in a local box. It might say, here's one for 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 the Yahoo dot, for the star dot Yahoo dot com. And notice that this one here says, here's a domain, here's a domain name service over here for the star, or for the um, Greg 
dot aduni dot org domain subdomain, and it has its own table. So what you do is you go to the you go to the top. You say, okay, I'm looking for um, let's say I'm looking for um, gambling dot greg. So this is Greg's side side thing here. Greg dot aduni dot org. So what do I do? Well, I first look at this part here, and I say, well, where, let's go to our root server and start figuring out where this, where this, how to resolve this. So root server says, oh, aduni.org, you know, I don't, I don't manage that. Someone else does. So we go to our aduni.org domain name ser server, and we say we're looking for um, greg.aduni, or so, uh, gambling.greg in here. So we, it looks through its table. It says, well, I don't know. I, I know that Greg is something I don't handle because there's I have a name server entry for it. And the person who does the Greg uh, name service is called Greg DNS. Oh, you want Greg? And you can give that back. And now I say, oh, well, where's Greg DNS? Because that's the one I need to go to. So I go back to, through this whole thing, and I say, oh, Greg DNS. That's this. So now I have the Greg DNS IP address. So now I go to the Greg DNS server, which is right here, and it'll have an entry for gambling. And of type A, and it can have something like 10.0.0.7 to be lucky here. Now, how does this relate, relate to uh, web addresses that are something gambling.greg.aduni.org slash whatever? That's a URL. So this is oh, what this what DNS does is it just takes a domain name. And it maps it to an IP address. Once you have that IP address, then you can start speaking HTTP, which which understands what the rest of that URL means. But at this level, we're just our goal is just to find this machine that's sitting out here somewhere. That's that's Greg's machine. That's this gambling.greg.aduni. Our, our goal is just to figure out how do we get messages to that machine to begin with. And so in general. You can see it's a little bit, it's a, it can take a lot of steps, right? You first, just to review, you first have to go and say, well, where's uni, who handles aduni.org? And you can do that through the root level servers, which will tell you where that, where that sits. So this is going to be, it's going to have some, you know, a64.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16.32.15.16
So they would assign you an IP address. They would assign you a um, DNS or a set of DNS servers, because usually you get two, maybe more, and some other information about your, your, your subnet so that you can communicate. Um, that tends to be the, if you type WinIP CFG to any Windows machine, you get a list of information that, that has to do with your local network settings. Um, so that, but that's the kind of thing you get from DHCP. There isn't anything out there that's an, just an EDU level server. You think about why would that be? Well, let's say you wanted to get to, or, dot, or a dot com server, since I picked EDU. Let's say we said we wanted to find MIT.edu, and we just had a server that said, you know, I'm the EDU server, right? Well, who's going to run the server that's, you know, if, if I want to look for MIT.edu, right, then who's going to tell me where the MIT.edu DNS is? And versus the Cornell.edu, or is this, well, it's probably going to be the same root level server, right? It's, it's because, you know, you have, there, there's all these, you know, if MIT runs its own thing, to get to the MIT one, you still need to go through the root. So the root ones will have these domain names of mumble.org, mumble.com, all the way down. The problem that happened was that as soon as everyone realized that these could be, these could be commercially interesting, they just went off and started buying them in bulk. And so there's a bunch of these that, that aren't necessarily even used, but just have been taken. Like what'll happen is when you new one of these top level domains come out, people just go into a frenzy to buy anything that's one, two, or three letters. Um, actually, um, yeah, one, two, or three letters because they're very easy to, to remember and they're probably gonna be useful to somebody. Um, and uh, so, so those are usually the first things that are gone. And then the four letter ones and five letter ones, because there's you know, more of them, they take a little longer to be gone. But usually, it's very hard to find any four or five letter uh, names these days that are, that are vaguely useful um, or memorable. Yes? Yeah, a, um, a domain name is something that, a domain name is a name in the, in this, in the name space, which is like mumble.mumble.mumble.mumble. A zone is, is the, uh, corresponds to what a particular DNS server what it manages. So in this case, a, a DNS server may manage a set of subdomains, which is part pieces of that namespace, and it may manage uh, and it may uh, delegate or it may have uh, pointers to other subdomains. And so a subdomain is just a piece of that namespace of the overall domain namespace. Other questions? Yes. 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 And and you can implement tables in a variety of ways, and you probably do. Like you probably want to have some hashing information or something to try to optimize the the lookups. Uh, but in general, this is that the association is a you know is a is a table one to one to one in this case. Okay. So do, do you guys understand this? How this works? How this domain name service works? And how how it can take a while to the, the, one of the questions that I ask in the, um, in the, t for tonight's uh, assignment is around accuracy of this thing. So one thing to, to keep in mind is just, you need to understand this to understand how we're gonna optimize it and how that's gonna introduce some, some issues. Okay. So this thing is, it takes way too long, right? I mean, what, how, many, how many different messages do you have to be sending back and forth to get something? Well, if you have to send one to your local because you're in DHCP, that takes you one to the root, right? Then that takes you back to something else. Then that takes you back to something else. I mean, this is just way too many, and you're sitting there just sending these back and forth until you finally get this thing. Um, in the best case, it's just two steps because you go to, you go to the, your root, and then you go to... You get, to the, you get to the next place right away. In the worst case, it can be a lot longer. The optimization is to use caching. I'm gonna introduce the notion of three types of uh, DNS servers. So there's authoritative, there's non-authoritative, and there's ca caching. Um, now, the authoritative servers are the ones that, have, that are supposed to have the most recent up-to-date, like real copy of the, the tape of these tables, and an authoritative each. Anytime you enter a domain 
into this whole system, it's required that you have at least two authoritative servers. And the reason for that is in case one fails, you want the other one to be up. And that when one fails, if both of them fail, then that's when you start relying on these other types of mechanisms. But that you required at least two. Some people have lots of authoritative servers um, because two might not be enough. And the non-authoritative servers, what they do is they replicate what the authoritative servers have. And the idea there is that they replicate it on a less frequent basis. So they do it maybe one or two times a day or you know, much, much less frequently because, remember, some of these tables can be huge. Uh, and so why would, what assumption is underlying this, you know, one to two times a day? Why so infrequent? Updates are less frequent. Yeah, that's right. You're assuming that updates are going to be a lot less frequent. Um, so what ends up happening is that these non-authoritative servers then replicate the authoritative server data throughout the Internet. Um, and at the very end, you can have what are called, or anywhere in between, but usually at the very end, you can have what are called caching servers. Now, caching servers, what they do is whenever they get a DNS, uh, whenever they perform a, a name resolution, they cache that, that the results of that. So if they find out that Greg, that uh, gambling that Greg, that aduni.org is 10007, then puts it in a, in a cache, in a table. And it just keeps caching and caching and caching. Now, the reason that's good is because if you're running one of these caching DNS servers on your local machine, is that now, instead of doing all this running around each time, you just, you know, you ask for it and boom, it's there. It's local. Not, you don't even have to go on the network. Okay? Um, now, well, before we get into the repercussions of that, um, one thing that a client has to be told is whether or not the data that it's getting is coming from an authoritative or non-authoritative source. So the client has, and this is to help the client decide what to do in case it's getting something that's consistent or not. So this issue was brought up before. There is no mechanism that guarantees consistency or DNS at all times. Um, and one, one way that one approach that people use to try to uh, get this consistency, at least a little bit, is that there's this notion of a time to live uh, number. What the DNS server can do is say, when it gives you a DNS, uh, an IP address, is to say, the time to live for this is a day or a week or something like that. And the caching server has to invalidate that entry once that time li limit is, is done. So this is one thing. If you if you're the person if you run a DNS service and you say, well, in my like down here at the lowest layer, and say Greg is um, you know has he connects his computer and takes it off you know once every hour because so the feds don't find him, <laughs> then uh, then uh, his time to live might be something like a, you know something shorter than a day, right? So it might be a little bit more frequently because he doesn't want to miss a single customer. Um, but someone else, like uh, you know Yahoo.com, might have it a little bit a little bit longer. Uh, Akamai for Akamai, it might be a, quite a bit shorter, because Akamai wants to be able to direct where you get your information from, and change that more more frequently. Uh, so there are reasons why you would or wouldn't want to have that TTL be long. So let's finish up by talking about some of the issues here. Um, DNS changes can take hours or days to propagate. If you, how many of you guys own your own domain name? Okay, good. So you know that when you when you put something when you make a change, you always get this message back saying, you know, this this will take 24 to 48 hours potentially to propagate. I found that sometimes it's very quick, and sometimes it's not. But that doesn't mean anything because I could be behind some, you know, maybe I have don't have that name in my cache, and, and maybe someone next door to me has it in their cache, and and they'll see my old one for a while. Um, so the TTL partially controls that, and as a client, you have to decide what to do. So if you go out and get, a, and get an IP address, you can't be 100% sure that it's the right one. So this actually introduces uh, the next issue, which is that DNS can be spoofed at some level, which is, which is that if you, when you get an IP address, I mean, you can't, you can't be absolutely positively sure that this is that this IP address corresponds to the machine that you're actually trying to reach. Someone could have gone in and and put an, a, DN, a, a rogue DNS server on a network that hands you the wrong thing. These DNS the uh, the uh, time to live might not have been set right, so you're getting wrong IP addresses. 
And what, what that means is this is why when you're doing something like HTTP uh, and you're doing a credit card, you usually have a secure layer on top of that. And what that secure layer does is it authenticates that the host that you reach is actually the, the, right, the real host because you can't be sure of that just because you got this IP address from the DNS. Um, the last thing here is that simple errors can create disasters. Uh, and to think about that, let's consider what happens if someone comes in and takes aduni.org at one of these root level servers and accidentally changes it to point to something else like this triple X thing. Right, or something, something that, something bad, and doesn't even realize it, and they walk away. When they come back, what could have happened at that point? A lot of propagation, right? And so, how long does it take to fix something like that? Typically, to repropagate out. Well, it depends on the time to live. It depends on right. So this thing could be around for days. Um, so if you go in and you and these and you ex, and you imagine if you did a imagine a different type of error imagine if you somehow accidentally shifted the all the entries down by one or up by one or did <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's it's going to cause chaos and and there was there was an incident that happened like this a while ago um, where somebody messed up one of these tables and like in that way where it was a more of a global type change and these this information just got propagated everywhere it caused a huge mess. Um, it was found very quickly um, by the person, but even so, it caused a huge mess for quite a while because these time to lives can can be long, you know, can be hours or longer. Um, one anecdote is that, um, from what I understand, these uh, these DNS servers they used to be hosted by just I don't know if they still are, but they used these root level ones used to be these machines in people's basements, and, uh, and there were these people who were sort of the keepers of these and. And the reason that was the case is because remember a while ago, a long time ago, not everybody had, you know, internet access, and, uh, and but you still wanted to be able to have these DNS servers spread out throughout the the internet, uh, and so sometimes you know someone from BBN who's who's here in uh, up in uh, who helped develop the internet, um, their research lab was uh, here by the LYFT station. I mean those guys, I'm sure they had some kind of in more interesting uh, internet service. If they had, a, some of them might have had some of these boxes in their basement. It, there's probably good reading on the internet about how that's working and some of these anecdotes. So if you, I suggest you, you know, take a look at that if you want to take a breather. So, so who pays for these DNS? Servers? What's that? Who, who pays for it? Well, um, at the root level, it used to be the case that these people who were the original founders of the of the internet were paying for it. So the research labs like BBN and MIT and so on. Um, these days. There's Akamai has a huge amount of these DNS servers all over the place for, to, for Akamizing content. Any of the uh, major ISPs, uh, Sprint, MCI, will have tons of DNS servers around to uh, Im improve the uh, Internet access uh, performance of all of their users. Media One, uh, those guys. Um, I'm sure the government has a bunch for, their dom for all their .gov domains. Um, so the, the cost has been distributed to the people who are, who are funding, who either use the, the network like uh, an ISPs or who who, um, who fund it, or also companies internally in, inside companies, they'll have a DNS infrastructure. Because if you're behind a firewall and you have your own sort of IP network behind it, you'll want to also have perf a good performance. Other questions about this? Okay. Okay.